scientifically accurate. Uh, Cold-blooded means they're a frog or something along those lines. So they croak much easier. But um, bum Where's Renee? Okay, we're talking about the local church specifically, and uh, today we're talking about the local church. The universal church is what? The body of Christ all over the world of all time, okay? That's the universal church. We're not talking universalism or Unitarianism, which basically says everybody gets to heaven or everything is God. Uh, that's pantheism, actually. Uh, but we're talking about the universal, meaning all people of all time who belong to Jesus Christ, the universal church. But we want to get down to a much more... Uh, regional, local level. So we're going to be looking at the local church here. Uh, MacArthur starts out, he says, the New Testament describes how believers came together in small groups to worship Christ. If you have paper and pencil, some of these things you might want to take notes on, or you just will remember it because you've heard it a zillion times, okay? They came together to worship Christ, to receive instruction from the scriptures, and to meet one another's needs, to pray, and to evangelize. Now, we might think, well, that's strange. I thought evangelism took place outside the church. It does. However, have you ever had people come in to say, what's going on here? What's this all about? And you had a lot of that in the early church, where people would say, you know, my neighbor's just really acting strange, and they're giving me things and they're doing all kinds of different things they're not behaving like they used to like shooting my dog you know any whatever it was but they would say what's this all about this is really strange these people are taking chances of being persecuted or even killed by the government or by the Jewish religious leaders I want to check it out for myself and they would many of them would come and experience salvation through Jesus Christ so even though the local church is not where we do evangelism, evangelism does take place in the local church, right? Hopefully, Hopefully yes. Hopefully. Okay? So first of all, let's, um, uh, well, let me read an article here. Uh, I think I've read some of this before, but I'll read it again. The Church of Jesus Christ is not an organization. It is an organism. What is the meaning of that? Okay, it's alive, yeah, growing, moving. Sorry? It all functions together. We remember the body analogy, you know, the hands, the leg, the feet, the mouth, all that. Okay? Now, there are some that would say, well, yes, the church is an organization because you've got bylaws or constitution. You've got all these other things. You're recognized by the state, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, if you want to get nitpicky in that way, it, it can be called that. But if, it, if a church looks at itself as an organization, then the pastor and the leadership board become CEOs. Uh, you become the stockholders, the shareholders. Uh, that's not what a local church is, is it? Yes, ma'am. An organization is a secondary or essentially an organism first. It's an organism first of all. It happens to be organized. Okay? Now think about that. Your body, is it organized? Well, some days more than others, obviously. But, you know, if, if the brain didn't tell the heart and the lungs and, and all the, the autonomic nerves what to do, we just kind of collapse in a pile, right? So we are organized. The scripture says that God is not a God of chaos, but of order. Okay? So, but that doesn't mean we're an organization, unless you are a robot, okay? And even then, you're organized by someone else. It's also not a building with offices. It is a fellowship that includes all believers, okay? Now, we do have offices here, quote, unquote. Many of you know I, I don't like to refer to my little place where I live in the week as an office. What do I refer it to? A study. Okay, you've caught that, haven't you? Okay. I do that very intentionally because that's where I want to be studying. 
and whether it's in counseling, whether it's in preparation for messages or discipleship or whatever. It's a study. We have an office here, but the church is not this building. If this building burned down or if this building was caught up in a tornado or whatever, it's welcome, Evelyn. She has wheels again. Okay. So, it, but we are, we are organized, but we're most importantly a fellowship of believers. Okay? So, when you go, let's say you go to Hannaford or Bud's or, or Moose Lake or whatever, and they, you go in there and they say, do you belong to the St. Albans Church? Or are you part of the St. Albans Church? Yes. You are. Not because of the building, but because of what the church is. It's the fellowship of believers, the body of believers. Okay? The church should not be focused on administration, but should be ministry focused. Have you noticed how I really, even though I tend to be administrative, I tend to be a dot the I and cross the T type of person. That's not what I want to be doing. What do I want to be doing? Ministry. I want to be impacting lives for Jesus Christ, whatever form that takes. Okay? Uh, okay. Dean, can you imagine that your only job was to photocopy music? Yeah. <laughs> we just lost him. Okay? He's wanting to do ministry. Okay? Uh, Brad, you, you come here every Sunday morning, you have your guitar, uh, you plug it in, and you say, my, what a nice guitar. Isn't it great? Is that ministry? No. It's using the gifts which God has given to you or the abilities or the talents that you have developed with his help to touch other people's lives for Jesus Christ. It's not making sure the paperwork's all done in triplicate. That is important, but that's not what it's all about. I, I tell people time and time again, if I have to choose between making sure all this administration is done or spending time with someone in need, you know what I'm gonna do? Spend time with someone in need. Because all that paperwork is going to get done or it's not going to get done, but it will mean nothing in eternity. My mother would say, I can't believe you said that. Because she knew me as one who always was detailed. Well, you still are paying attention to details. It's the more important thing. Right, there you go. I like that. That's good. That's still the detail. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. But we, we often don't see it that way, do we? You're right. You're right. The church is people living and loving, learning and laboring, leading and following together for the glory of Jesus Christ who is the head. That's what we are. So when we come together here, we don't come as perfect people, do we? We come here as perfected in Jesus Christ, but not perfect. As long as we still walk around in this shell, we struggle. And sometimes when one struggles and the other's having a really great day and they're experiencing victory after victory in Christ, what happens? What should happen, I should say? Come alongside them and lift them up. Absolutely. Come alongside and lift them up. Or just listen. Just be there. Minister to them. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. And, and that is amazing. We, even here in our little community, we've had some wonderful, God honoring believers who have ministered to us from Uganda, from the Philippines, from all over the world, that without Jesus Christ, there'd be no reason that they would come here. There'd be no reason that we'd invite them here. 
We, we sometimes will meet people in the community that we have no idea who they are. But like you said, there's that connection, and all of a sudden you'll begin visiting about the things of Christ. Okay? So, um, where did Christians meet before they had church buildings? Oh, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Romans 16.5. Interesting passage. Romans 16, 5. I'll just read that. Also, greet the church that is in their house. And then he talks about greeting others. He's talking about Priscilla and Aquila who risk their necks, as it were, for the kingdom of God. And he's basically saying, greet the people who meet in their house. Now, that's because... Where, where was the quote-unquote church? It really wasn't a church, but the large group gathering normally of those who supposedly followed God. No, before. The temple. Okay, the synagogues, the temples. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's the believers. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going before that a little bit. Where? That, that's no. What, that's what before there was a temple in the oh, temple yes. Okay. Temple. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But I'm thinking also that the early church would sometimes meet by the rivers because right. baptism, etc. Yeah. So that was typically where they would meet. Normally it would be a temple or a synagogue. Okay. And now here you've got the church. Well, you think the temple's going to rent some space out? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, they would have killed him. Sure, come on in. <laughs> You're dead. Uh, you know, it just... And, and so where do you meet? Well, your home, and even the Jewish law states that you cannot go into someone else's home and hurt them, etc., or take their home or their property or whatever. Uh, so even the legalistic Jews or Judaizers would not do that, so you'd meet in the homes, okay? Uh, right now, Nathaniel and Emily, Nathaniel serves as an elder at their church in Hutchinson, and uh, one of their associate pastors has been commissioned to go to Wichita, Kansas, which is, you think, they need another church. Can't believe that one. But there's different areas that really don't have evangelical churches. So you look at the, the large city of Wichita, you can't say that there's going to be one church for this huge, huge city, okay? So you've got churches that are in sections of town, and hopefully that's what they're doing rather than trying to recruit from other places. So Nathaniel and Emily are part of a core group that have been planted, and you, can you guess where they're meeting at the beginning? In a home. Okay? They're going to start out with a small group Bible study. Uh, they're going to reach out into that neighborhood, which has not had any outreach. And basically, the people go there because the housing was cheap in that section of town. It's a little bit run down. And so now they're going to get the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry? Yeah, the Amish, the Holdeman, uh, actually some of the Holdeman meet in churches. Some of the Amish actually will meet in churches, but many of the Amish will meet in the barns of different families. Uh, very common. Uh, the Quakers uh, used to meet in the barns uh, of different people. Then they started building meeting houses. And, uh, and you know, our, our Mennonite people, many of them we met in barns and then we started building these ridiculously crazy prairie churches. And uh, it's kind of evolved. And part of that is, as cultures evolve, if I can use that phrase, people move farther and farther away from each other. Uh, and so how do you keep this family that used to be here, because you only had horses and small equipment, now you've got these ginormous tractors, which means ginormous acreage and so people aren't as close anymore how do you keep that together well you will build different churches uh, in South Dakota we had six Mennonite churches 
uh, in a 20 mile area. Why is that? Well, a lot of people, obviously. But as people began to spread apart, you know, the Brudertal would want to meet with their people, the Hutterites would meet with their people, uh, the Mennonite Brethren would meet with our people because we came from a particular village or colony someplace else, which is how much of that came about. Here in the New Testament, you've got a group in an area, let's say this is an area where a lot of people live, and we've got about this many who are actually Christians, where are we going to meet? How are we going to mutually encourage each other? How are we going to grow? Well, Priscilla and Aquila have a nice house, plenty of space there. Let's meet there. Okay, so that's how it came about. The idea that today uh, church buildings are of the devil, uh, that we should only meet in homes, that's the true church, that's, that's taking something in Scripture that was descriptive and making it prescriptive. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is simply a description of what was. It's not saying this is how it ought to be. And we need to be careful of that. Uh, pews. There's a good example. How many of you remember our pews here? Yeah. How many of you were at the wedding, was it Brady's wedding, where the second row of pews cracked and all of a sudden the family gets up and moves over? Uh, we, yeah, that, that, that was a first for me, let me tell you. Uh, it's kind of like, oh, no, they're all going to go down. Who's going to pick them up? Uh, and I think you and some other people repaired those about four or five times within a year. Uh, and so we have this now, which, do you want to go back to pews or do you like this? Yeah, this is good. My wife keeps saying, but we don't have coffee cup holders. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she's always got something cute to say. So it, we, we've done this. Well, we never did that before. The church always had pews. Well, it's not, the Bible doesn't give us a prescription for how we sit you know, if you want to do that, then, then in Acts, it talks about the fellow that fell out of the window because he fell asleep. Does that mean we're all supposed to sit on window ledges? <laughs> Same kind of logic. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. First Corinthians 16, 19. It's a repetition, but I think it's important that we see that. If you have it, just read it out loud. Okay, so there we have it again. They're meeting together in a house at the time. Necessary, practical. It was a good thing to do. Okay, so again, that's not what's required. That's what was. We're looking at the early church in particular and the local church illustrated. Yes, sir. There you go. We already talked about that once, Paul. <laughs> Fun discussion that was, wasn't it? Okay, Acts 20, verse 7. We know where the early church met, met rather. Acts 20, verse 7. When did they meet? At 11 o'clock Sunday. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Which, you know, if that's the case, why do our services end an hour and a half or less later? You know, all day they met. Uh, and, and again, our tradition used to be, you know, you've got your chores in the morning, you come, you worship, and you uh, then you have a community meal, a church community meal, and then after the meal's over, you have another worship service. Uh, you want to get really crazy, uh, 
because most of the ministers were lay pastors in the community, you'd often have three pastors up on the stage. Okay? One pastor preaches a full-fledged message. And then special music. You know how special music was done? I'm so glad I'm not part of that culture anymore. This family over here, the Peter Z. Friesen family, we'd like you to come up and share a song. Nobody said, are you kidding me? They just got up, the whole family, and they came up and they did a song. After that song, you think service is over? Second pastor comes up. He gives a full message. Well, how about the Henry D. Reimer family? We haven't heard from you for a while. Come on up here and share with us in music. It's all a cappella, by the way. Multiple parts. And so this went on until all three pastors had shared. And then the first pastor would come back up and review what they'd all heard. Sounds like a good idea, don't you think? <laughs> Why is everybody dripping sweat now? <laughs> okay? So, you know, but they, here they met on the first day of the week. What is the first day of the week? Sunday. I hate business calendars that start on Monday. Well, this is the first day. No, it's the first day of the work week. But the first day of the week is Sunday. Okay? Well, I thought we're supposed to worship on the Sabbath. In the Old Testament. And that was for all people or for whom? For the Jews. It was for the Jewish people. That was guidelines for them specifically. Now, is it wrong to worship on Saturday? No. Thank you. Right, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. The, in, in city environments, you've got churches that will meet Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. And it's, it's the full-fledged worship. Why do they do that? Because in the city, you've got jobs that don't fit neatly into the rural culture. And sometimes your Saturday or Friday night service is ginormous. It's huge. Except in Texas. There the Friday night worship is at the football fields at the high school. <laughs> Sad to say. But that, you know, that's how it is. However, yeah, anytime, and I like that, the edict, it's, it's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. And we choose to worship on the first day of the week because the early church did. Why did the early church meet on the first day of the week? To celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ when he arose from the dead on the first day of the week. Pastor? Yes. There are some historians that suggest that they did. Right. Right. And the Jewish culture, they didn't want to abandon per se, but the Jewish legalism, a lot of the false rabbinical laws that were developed, they understood that was wrong. But some of them, and from what historians that I've read suggest it wasn't just that they wouldn't abandon, but that they would have an opportunity to try and win their brothers in, to Christ, right? And that would make sense. Uh, you know, for years, I would actually meet someone in, in a truck stop who'd always come there to have a beer and stuff like that. Uh, I would meet them there on a regular basis, not because I enjoyed truck stop food. I, I not usually because it's usually quite greasy, uh, but it was his place to meet. It was his safe haven, and so we'd meet there, and we'd visit, 
I prefer the donut shop, actually. But, the <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there. So that's what they did. Now, Acts 2.42. By the way, we have groups that meet Sunday night. Right now, we're not really meeting. Uh, or are you, Ron, on, on Sunday nights? Um, about once a month. About once a month now? Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, and we call it Acts 2.42. When Janita and I began that years ago, uh, we did it with the idea of this passage, Acts 2.42, a uh, small group passage. What did they do? Verse 42. Yeah. This is one verse in my Bible that I have highlighted. I've got bracketed. I've got parentheses. I've got underlined different places. I, I see here they were continually devoting themselves. Now you think devotion, that's all you need, right? They were devoting themselves to this. That shows consistency, right? But the Holy Spirit caused Luke to write down they were continually devoting themselves. That was their focus. It wasn't just hit and miss. He wanted to make it clear they were totally committed to this, to teaching, not just to any teaching, but to the apostles' teaching. And the apostles' teaching came from whom? The Holy Spirit. And from Christ's ministry. To fellowship. What is fellowship? Yeah, sharing what God's doing in your life. Sometimes it's just hanging out with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I find myself really enjoying sometimes just kind of standing, listening to conversations here. I get blessed hearing what God's doing in other people's lives. I don't have to say anything, but I'm fellowshipping. Ooh, what? I like one person. There's two or more people, two or more fellows in a ship. Think about it. Now, are ships always smooth sailing? Sometimes they're pretty rough. Hopefully you don't jump out and do a Jonah or get thrown out, okay? Hopefully you're, you're there saying, hang on, we can weather this because Jesus is the captain, okay? So you've got teaching. They devoted themselves continually to teaching, to fellowship, to... Was that because the bread was hard? What? Eating together. Yeah. You're breaking it off. You're sharing. If you come to our house at mealtime, we will put a plate down if you haven't eaten and say, join us. And even though my wife will say beforehand, make sure it gets enough for everybody else because sometimes there's certain foods, oh yeah, <laughs> just keep piling it on. I won't name the person that does that. But... Um, we said, make sure there's enough to go around for everybody. But if you come, you know what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to get served first. Or if we've already got stuff on our plate, we'll say, no seconds. We won't really say it out loud. But what well, we might, depends on who's going for it. Uh, but, you know, everybody gets, there's always enough. And we've even, so, and I think with you one time, I said, we've got sandwiches, we've got cereal, you know, come join us. Did we do that with you one time too? Yeah, because to us, it's, it's not about the T-bone steak. It's about we give you whatever you need for sustenance. What are you having for dinner? <laughs> it's usually Father's Day and my birthday. <laughs> there you go. You come by and you get to help grill it. <laughs> Actually, I, I would look forward to that. Now, if all of you come by, we're going to have to go out and kill us. And anyway, don't tell the tailors. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. I, yeah, we won't get into all that I can do because that's not that much. And to prayer. What is prayer? Talking with God. Sometimes it's sharing scriptures together. In worship and praise, just talking with God. No flowers needed, just conversation. Because when you come together as God's people, 
And hopefully when you're visiting with each other, when you say, I'll pray about that, you're not just saying, I'll pray about that. Uh, you'll oftentimes find me now with my, I don't have my phone with me, but I have this, or I'll have a bulletin. And if you share something with me and I'll say, I'll pray about that, I will turn and write it down because... And I want to be a man of my word. I want to pray on your behalf. That way when God does something, I get to rejoice even more with you. Or I get to cry even more with you. Okay? So this is what the early church did. And that's why we, we had the Acts 242 groups. Now, my wife and I are somewhat idealistic we would love to see every single person in the church part of an Acts 242 group. Hasn't happened. And that's okay. We also don't want to be judgmental. Because let's face it, there are some times that we would just rather stay home and be with our families. And that's okay. Because if you haven't heard me say yet, your family is far more important than any meeting Okay. There's also other things going on in our church besides Acts 2.4. Absolutely. And, and that's what we look at. We say, there's something for everybody. There really is. And even though we don't call them Acts 2.42 groups, they really are. You know, it's kind of, kind of long to say women to women Acts 2.42. Or first place for health Acts 2.42. Yeah, it's not necessary. Okay, the local church organized. Now, according to Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, we have some pretty good information there. He says, and he, meaning the Holy Spirit, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, an apostle is literally someone who is sent on a mission. That's someone who is sent on a mission. Now, in the strict sense of the definition, it would include the original 12 apostles, not Judas, because he was the son of perdition, but Matthias who took his place. But you have the original 12, and you also have Paul, because he was uniquely set apart on a mission to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, specifically to the Gentiles. Okay? Qualifications of an apostle, uh, in the strict sense, was that they were to be chosen directly by Christ. Now, there are some that would say, Christ was already resurrected when Paul was chosen. Who chose him? Jesus did. Because he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That was the Christ, the resurrected Christ. Okay? So he was uniquely, directly chosen by Christ. Also, you had to have seen the resurrected Christ. All of the original 12 did. What about Paul, on the Damascus Road, yeah, absolutely. So all those qualifications fit, okay? So if that's the case, has anybody here been directly appointed by Jesus Christ? And has anybody here directly seen the resurrected Christ? And if anybody says, yes, I will call you a liar, because the scripture is very clear that when he comes again, he's not going to come to this planet per se. He's going to meet us in the air. But when he comes again, it's to set up the millennial kingdom. Okay. Therefore, there are no biblical apostles in the strict sense on this planet today. And the reason I say that is because there are some people who claim to be an apostle of Christ and they have new information. Well, it's kind of hard to argue with someone that says, well, Jesus told me, and I'm an apostle. Unless you just say, no, you're not. 
Okay? And in a wider sense, an apostle can refer to some who were not members of the Twelve and Paul, but were sent on a mission. Okay? Barnabas was sent by the Spirit of God on a mission in Acts chapter 14. Silas and Timothy, others. So there were many who did were sent on a specific mission. Now, prophets, we talked a little bit about prophets. What are the two different kinds of prophets? Can you help me out? Okay, good. Foretelling and forthtelling. Now, that's kind of a cute, neat little alliteration. What's foretelling? Future, predictive. Now, for a prophet to be a genuine prophet, what has to occur? It has to be 100% true. So all of these quote-unquote prophets that have predicted the end of the world, they're not. They're false. Totally false. Exactly. So, which is amazing that so many people don't get that. What is forth telling? What I'm doing. What any of us here can do. Teaching God's word, teaching what his spirit has revealed to us, not above and beyond, but what the word of God actually says. It's proclamation. Okay? They were to lay the foundation of divine truth upon which the church would be built. Now, upon completion of the New Testament, the office of prophet ceased. The foretelling. No more need for that. We have all that we need in God's word. It's kind of like, well, how can I find the will of God? Look in the Bible. What, what, what does the Bible say? That's where you find the will of God. Well, I don't know what kind of car to get. Okay, which one gets the best gas mileage? You, know, <laughs> you won't find that in the Bible. I, I like what one professor said. When you became a Christian, you, did not, you were not told to kiss your brains goodbye. You use common sense. And yeah, you pray about it. But, you know, I don't think God cares what brand of car you purchase. And believe it or not, he doesn't really care if the Patriots win or lose. I know that's a hard one to swallow, but, you know. That, that's a good question. She asked, does he care whether you can afford it or not? Okay. Okay. And that, for that, we go to God's word. And his will is to live within our means, okay? To live within our means, preferably to not be in debt, okay? Now, the reality is uh, there are some teachers of different financial things. Uh, they speak a little bit heavier than what Scripture teaches on that because Scripture does talk about debt. And if you have to loan money to someone else, you don't charge excessive interests. There are guidelines given. Why would we have the year of Jubilee? Because some people got themselves into debt because of crisis situations. Okay? And I used to be one of those that I harped and harped and harped on no debt, no debt, no debt, no debt. I still believe that's the best way to go. But the reality is the scripture does give us some guidelines. It's not always possible. It's not always possible. Okay? Uh, evangelists. That's a person particularly gifted in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, every single one of us should practice evangelism, right? Now, you may not have the gift of evangelism, but every one of us can proclaim Jesus. Therefore, we're evangelists. I remember an individual from uh, the Evangelical Mennonite Church that we were part of back in the 80s, and uh, this guy was a, a retired missionary, quote-unquote, and he was driving on his way to our convention, 
he got pulled over by a policeman and was given a ticket for speeding. And as he's sharing with us, the officer basically asked him what he was in such a hurry, why he was in such a hurry. And he said, I'm on my way to a church conference, and I know I was speeding. And then he proceeded to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with this officer. Led him to salvation, said, thank you for the ticket, and went on his way. And he, no, <laughs> this guy was a unique individual. He served the Dominican Republic, and he had some stories. But that fellow, I'm convinced, had the gift of evangelism. I mean, he could probably speak to a post that if it had a soul, it would be saved. Uh, it was just that gifted, not, not literally, of course. But uh, Whereas someone like myself, I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if I were to look back as how many people actually came to salvation through my presentation, I probably would be batting less than 300. That's three out of ten people. And the interesting thing is, we have to remember that we're always planting seed. And so somebody else may come along and see the harvest. And even the harvest that I got to see, somebody else probably planted seed. It, it's not my presentation. It's all the Spirit of God. So the gift of evangelism is unique, but all of us are evangelists. Okay? Okay. Um, pastors and teachers, and, and by the way, that's really not two separate. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Well, I, originally the Greek word had a reward given to the messenger for good deeds, so it wasn't just the message of good deeds. Right. The original Greek meaning was that, that there was a reward given to the messenger of the good deeds. So that they got to see the harvest. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the evangelist is actually u angelos, which u would be the good, and the angelos would be the messenger. Uh, so, yeah, you think about it, that's absolutely true. Because who is not blessed out of their socks when someone comes to salvation when you present the message, right? That, that's pretty amazing. Pastor, teacher, it's one who shepherds, cares for, and protects God's people. Uh, MacArthur says, teaching is the primary function of pastors. My wife and I believe very strongly that the best counseling I can do is preaching and teaching. And let the Holy Spirit do His work. Now, we recognize that sometimes it takes some one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two. -two. Sometimes it just takes that because in a larger con... You, none of you ever get distracted during the message, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Paul even brought Dr. Pepper today, you know, his attempt to stay awake during the message. Uh, even when I'm out here and somebody's preaching, you think I have squirrel moments up there? I get major squirrel moments out here. And so if somebody's going through a crisis or going through some terrible hard times where their soul is sick, if you will, or their heart is aching, where do you think their mind's going to be? On that. Many times on that. And I don't kid myself thinking that every single person out here is tuned into what I'm saying. I really wish they were. But I also know that the Holy Spirit's doing a work in each person's life, and he does it in a unique way. So that person that is soul sick, if you will, may need to come see me privately so we can engage in a way that God's word becomes relevant to them right then. Okay? But again, I, I go back to if we are studying God's word, and if I'm preaching and teaching God's word, that's the best equipping that can happen, the best counseling that can take place. He says, teaching is the primary function of pastors. The job of pastor-teacher is to faithfully preach the Word of God. Okay? So that helps you to understand a little bit more about how the organization of the local church is, in particular with gifted people. 
uh, to shepherd the church and to help lead the church in a variety of ways. You all have elders and overseers. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, and Titus 1, 6 through 9. First Timothy three, one through seven, and Titus one, six through nine. So as you look at First Timothy three, one through seven, it, it uh, some of your Bibles will have little headings up there, and some of them will call them bishops or elders. He says, it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it is a fine work he desires to, to do. An overseer or bishop, then, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil." That's the qualifications. Uh, the husband of one wife, uh, we know of one church one time that there was a very godly individual. He was probably in his early 40s and uh, biblically he's qualified to serve as an elder, but they would not let him. Can you guess why? He wasn't married. He was a bachelor. Well, they misunderstand what the word really means. It means a one-woman kind of man. That's what the husband of one wife means. And there are some that would say, well, what about the divorced person? Well, that person wasn't a one-woman kind of man, usually. Does that mean one woman at a time? <laughs> I've actually heard that, and that is not what it means. <laughs> yeah. We, we laugh at that, but... I, I actually heard that one time. It's like, are you serious? It sounds like that's a funny statement. What about the husband, the man who has had no choice in his wife? She wanted gone. She wanted to die. Right. What about him? He, he, like I said, he didn't have any choice in it. Does that nullify him to be a pastor? <sighs> And, and that's where we get into the hairs. Uh, it, it's, it's really difficult to, to say. Personally, my understanding of this would be based upon history that might have disqualified Paul. Because historians, many of them will suggest that he had been married and his wife left him. When? Don't know. I don't know the validity, of the validity of that, but there are a lot of scholars who go that route. I have had conversations with a particular individual who said that any man who is married and his wife dies and then he remarries is an elder. Which, biblically, that's not right. Because he was a one-woman kind of man. Especially if they came out of a real pagan background. In the Jewish culture, not right. during that time. Right. But and for them to, you know, be able to say so would be worse if you were not. Right. Right. And, and it's, again, it's, it's one of those fine lines. The interesting thing I find is 
those individuals who have come from situations that were beyond their control, if, if I can use that phrase, uh, they're the ones who tell me, I know that I'm not qualified. And the ones who seek to be eligible, their background was very intentional and they knew better and they made some wrong choices, even though they've experienced renewal and revival now. Well, look at all the whole, the whole context. Are they above reproach? Do they have a good reputation with outsiders at that point? If they were playing the field or not being faithful earlier on, especially those who've made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and then one, two, three, you know, however many uh, adulterous relationships, and then all of a sudden they have a come to Jesus time. Uh, and I'm not denying that that can happen, but they need to understand they are not qualified. They're not qualified. And it's, it's not trying to be cruel and heartless and mean, but it, it's reality. When I was the chairman of the Provincial Board of Church Extension in Saskatchewan, that, all that means is church planting. Okay? Uh, when pastors would you know, send their resumes and stuff to me and to our board uh, seeking church planting opportunities, you know what one of the things I did, not by myself, but with the whole board, is I w wrote back to their committee. We wrote or called, uh, didn't have cool stuff like email and text messaging. This is back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and I went and checked out with the local lumber yard, the local hardware store, their phone company, their electric company, if they rented. Uh, what was I checking on? To see if they paid their bills. To see if they paid their bills. Now, one of the things that prompted me to do that was because when I was in Oklahoma, I uh, went to the lumberyard one time to get some stuff for our church, and the owner of the lumberyard says, if you're a church, I will not charge it because I've had too many pastors stiff me. I was absolutely astounded. I thought, how can you claim to be a follower of Christ and not pay your bill? Because to me, it's your yes is yes, your no is no. Anything else is of the devil. And when you make a promise to pay a bill, you're obligated. Absolutely. So that's why I did that. It was interesting to check some of these guys out. Uh, there was one or two of them, I recall, that didn't have a very good reputation. Therefore, didn't even get the first interview. I, I wouldn't even grant the first interview because they did not have a good reputation with outsiders. Okay? Uh, some, everything was good, but their arrogance just came ahead of them. And, uh, and I was very grateful for a couple board members that would just say, Leonard, this, this guy's not going to work. He's not going to work. I didn't have to. That was cool. Because <laughs> I, I hate being the bad guy. But that's part of the qualifications here. Two major responsibilities of an elder are 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. First Peter 5, 1 and 2. Two major responsibilities you see here. He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. I have to do this. No, no. But voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for a sordid gain. What's in it for me? But with eagerness. You don't have it in your Bibles? <laughs> okay. So, first responsibility is to do what? Shepherd the flock. What's involved in shepherding? I mean, we can say these things, but I want you to understand, what is shepherding? Guiding? Feeding. Yeah, feeding. Sometimes prodding, yeah. Protecting. Exhorting. Sometimes a little extra challenge. 
So all those things, taking care of the people God has placed under your, how shall I say that? I don't want to say rule, because that's not what it is, but under your leadership, under your care. Thank you. Much better. Much better. Second responsibility. Pretty much the same thing, exercising oversight. It's kind of the buck stops here. Exercising oversight. That's the responsibility. It's not building programs. It's not programs. It's not finances. I mean, to a degree it is, uh, because that's the exercising oversight. But what, what do we say about that in the church? Everybody works together. God has people in place for that. And many of you know that I will not mess with church finances. I just, if, if I do, there's going to be so many checks and balances. Uh, and I make sure of that. Uh, even the other night at the movie, uh, we, we need to count this up, okay? Corey, you and Janita go count it up together, seal it in an envelope, put it away. They told me what the amount was, which, by the way, was $100. What a blessing that was. Because I think it cost us $199 to, to uh, have permission to show it publicly. So, oh man, 10.15, how did that happen? Wow. <laughs> okay, let's get ready for our worship time. Incredible. 